So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Arthur, and I have the uh, honour of being the President and Provost of UCL. And I know that we have lots of uh, visitors from outside uh, the university uh, this evening, so it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to what I think will be a really interesting evening as we launch the new UCL Institute for Innovation uh, and Public Purpose. Um, this uh, is going to be housed uh, and be associated with the Bartlett, the uh, Faculty for the Built Environment, um, and that's a very good place for it to be, as I'm sure will become clear uh, as the evening uh, goes on. Uh, UCL um, wants to make an impact on real-world uh, problems. <coughs> Our new Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose and its founder, founder uh, our director, Mariana Mazzucato, will play a critical part in this um, agenda. Uh, and IIPP will build on the tremendous impact that Mariana's work is already having uh, around the world. In, in her book, The uh, Entrepreneurial State, she explained the need to develop new frameworks to understand the role of the state in economic growth and how to enable rewards from innovation to be just as social as the risks taken. She's advised poli policymakers uh, around the world uh, on innovation-led growth. She's currently a member of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers, a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Leadership Council, and CITRA, that's the Finnish uh, Innovation Fund uh, Advisory Panel. She's a winner of the New Statesman Speary Prize in Economics uh, and the German Friedreich uh, Ebert Siftung Prize. Uh, and last week, uh, I'm delighted to tell you that she uh, became the winner of the prestigious 2018 uh, Leon Tief uh, Economics Prize for Advancing uh, Economic Thought. And then just to bring you right up to date, today she's been announced as a new fellow uh, of the Academy uh, of Social Sciences. Congratulations. <laughs> so uh, my conclusion is that um, IIPP aims to uh, break exciting new ground and rethink the role of the public in the economy. Uh, it's not as simple as is often characterized as a question of being public versus private we need to think about how to build the dynamic partnerships needed to tackle the grand challenges of the 21st century. So I, I'm very much, looking, uh, very much looking forward to seeing what uh, Mariana and her new institute can do uh, in that regard. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Professor Alan Penn, uh, who's Dean uh, of the UCL uh, Faculty for the Built Environment affectionately known as the Bartlett. Alan. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Michael. And uh, my job is actually very quick. Um, I've got to really say a little bit about why it is that the Bartlett would be the right place uh, for the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose. That might not seem instantly obvious. And when David Price, whose inspiration this was actually, uh, came to me and said, you should meet Mariana, um, I was sort of, are you sure? Um, but when we did meet, it became very clear um, that there are links, and the links are that what we do in architecture, in planning, in the construction of the built environment is always driven by a vision. And what we have to do is train people up to construct a world that we want to live in in the future. And in doing that, what we're doing is we're shaping the future of society. Now, it seems that the whole idea about public purpose and about the role of the state in mission-oriented uh, projects, in working towards something with a direction and with vision, um, is actually the link. Personally, I believe that design is going to be a crucial component of how this, um, uh, this in Innovation and Public Purpose Institute will uh, will function. 
Um, but for the moment, I think it's adequate to say that what we're doing is looking towards influencing government to take direction and to take responsibility for direction about the shape of future society. I'm not going to say anything about the current state of government. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over to Mariana. Mariana, thank you very much. So thank you so much for the introduction, um, Michael Arthur and Alan Penn and David Price. It's completely true that it, it was uh, David's fault that I'm here. Um, we had wonderful conversations and I absolutely got convinced that UCL was the place to build an institute that has the ambitions and the aims that I'll be speaking about today. It's a university that was the first in England to accept women, the first in England to accept people of all religious beliefs as well as those who don't have religious beliefs. Um, and it continues to be uh, constantly reinventing itself in order to shape and direct also what is the university for. And that really is the Grand Challenges program, which very much, in fact, I think is the, at the heart of um, David's um, own office around research and impact. And um, Alan is completely right. There is really no better place to be housing this institute than in the school for the built environment. And why is that? Well, markets and the economy is built, right? Uh, markets are actively shaped and co-created by the different types of actors. Sorry, I'm just trying to look for the clicker while I'm talking. Here we go. Um, <laughs> and um, this might seem obvious to some people, probably the common person, sure, you know, markets are built, they're, they're created, but actually we often pretend that somehow there are these things called market forces or economic forces. Um, and that also gives sort of an excuse to different actors in the economy. And I'll be focusing today, by the way, on the public, but this is all about partnerships. It's public, private, the voluntary sector, civil society that are actively co-shaping and co-creating markets. But this notion that there's these market forces and yeah, you know, sometimes you got to do things that aren't that great, but we have to do it, is, is a really easy excuse and that then gets us the wrong types of markets. Just think of two examples. Um, think of people like John Kay or Andy Haldane who've been talking about the costs of short-termism, the problems with current corporate governance structures, the problems with what we often call financialization of the economy. So things like companies focusing too much on their share prices and you know, uh, buying back shares to boost share prices, stock options, and executive pay. When you actually then speak to the companies that are doing that, and by the way, the ones that are the most financialized just happen to be in the energy sector and in the pharmaceutical sector, two very important uh, parts of the economy that could be, if they were mission-driven, redirecting things. They say, mm, well, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's you know, either they say there's no opportunities or we'd like to do things differently, but there are these strong pressures um, coming to us from these shareholders. And that completely uh, misses the point that actually there's a huge diversity between different types of firms in any given sector on the actual decisions they are making precisely around those areas. There's a whole literature called varieties of capitalism. There's different types of capitalism. There's different types of ways to structure markets. And in fact, all you need to do is look at any sector like telecoms, and you see this. You might have companies like Huawei, number one in the world. It's a Chinese company. It's a cooperative. Uh, you might have companies like Ericsson, which comes from a part of the world, Scandinavia, where you have this stakeholder type of capitalism, where you have different people at the table actually negotiating and discussing what might have to happen to those profits. And then you have companies like Cisco which are one of the companies that many people like Bill Izanik have talked about as being overly financialized. So there's this sort of, you know, there's agency, there's strategic decisions, there's different types of decisions that these actors within the private sector can make. It's not true that the market is imposing a certain kind of behavior. And similarly, in the public sector, think of, again, critiques which many people of different stripes have made to this uh, obsession, if you want, of cutting the deficit and saying that that perhaps is the wrong Target, some people talk about this as austerity. When you talk to you know, particular policymakers who might be in charge of, um, of uh, policies, let's just call it for simplicity now, the austerity policies, they too sometimes lazily use the word the market. It's the market pressure. It's the financial markets that are imposing this on us. And again, completely ignoring that there's all sorts of different ways 
that in fact we could run public institutions and even the deficit itself could be seen um, and interpreted and understood in different types of ways. So by blaming the market, it's almost like um, excusing yourself from talking about the agency, the strategic decision making that is actually required in order to drive an economy and reach the kind of market outcomes we want. Anyway, all to make a long story short, markets are built, they are absolutely designed in the sense that all these different organizations themselves, I've already mentioned the word governance, are designed in different ways. Again, the word corporate governance or different types of public institutions, but especially their interactions. There's different ways in which different actors in the economy can interact. And we could think about design in that way too. I personally really dislike the word ecosystem, which is quite trendy nowadays when people want to talk about partnerships, because again, it sort of just assumes that that's a good thing. We're part of an ecosystem. Um, ignoring that there's different types of ecosystems. There's parasitic ecosystems, predator-prey ecosystems, mutualistic ecosystems, symbiotic ecosystems. So how do we design the interactions between public, private, voluntary sector, and of course the civil society movements which have always been absolutely critical um, in capitalism informing markets in such a way that we actually get the you know, market outcomes that we want. And this is a very exciting time to be thinking about that because this notion that you know, economic growth has not just a rate but also a direction is very much out there, especially after the financial crisis. Just go to the European Commission, you'll see it plastered all over the place. We want smart, inclusive, sustainable growth. You go to the UN, the OECD, different ministries around the world talk about particular types of growth. So bringing back agency, strategic decision making, consciousness, into the organizations that are fundamental um, in capitalism in terms of how they're interacting is absolutely critical. And this in some ways is the aim of IIPP, which is especially within the public, not because the public is more important than any other actor, but bringing back agency, consciousness, purpose, decision-making, mission-orientedness within the public sector in order for it not only to help guide and direct, but especially also to be a better partner you're going to be a more interesting dynamic partner if you can do that. And I'll try to uh, convince you about this. Now, this is also about value. I've, I've just finished a book that should be coming out in uh, March, if all goes well, actually about value, rethinking what do we even think about value. And, and I won't say much about that now, but you know, what we're talking about when we talk about markets as outcomes is also about value. And I don't want to go into the word values. Let's just word, use the word value for now. Value is a collective process. These different actors who I've already mentioned, public, private, voluntary sector, civil society, together create value. Now, you don't normally hear, when you think about different types of public institutions, the public as a value creator. You might think or hear how important it is for value to be redistributed in progressive ways, and we can use progressive taxation to do that. You might hear the word uh, enabling or facilitating the value creators, but you don't really hear, and we don't have a theory about this, and I'll talk quite a bit about this particular point, about different public institutions in terms of co-creating um, value. And this is a huge problem. Why? Because being a value creator is actually exciting. Being a wealth creator makes you kind of confident, right? We are wealth creators. We're in Silicon Valley and we create wealth and hence we need X, Y, and Z from government. We don't hear about the different government structures, instruments, policies, and how to formulate them in order to create wealth. Now, when I say, when I talk about confidence, it might be a simplistic word, but confidence matters. When you have different people at the table negotiating, Okay, and everything gets negotiated, right? Patents, this thing we call IPR, intellectual property rights. They're not rights, they're contracts. They have to be negotiated. If you're not confident, you probably won't negotiate very well. Um, I'll give you some examples later, but there's some very interesting things that have occurred over the last 200 years when you had different partners at the table that were equally confident. When instead you have some that are considered the wealth creators, and who are taking really cool courses. This must have 
gone bad transferring from uh, my computer to this screen. It looked much better than mine. Uh, taking these cool courses called Strategic Management, Organizational Behavior, Decision Sciences. Why are they taking those classes in business schools? Regardless of whether you've been to a business school or not, just believe me, these are three interesting classes that leading executives are you know, asked to take in order to create value. Think about your strategy. Think about how to rejuvenate yourself when you become big, right? Because companies, when they become big and bureaucratic, might get a bit too inertial, a bit too slow. How do you rejuvenate the mature corporation? That's actually a, a famous textbook. Um, how do you actually make decisions in such ways that also enable bottom-up experimentation so you can direct the company, but at the same time really welcome the explorative capacity of your workforce? These things are taught because companies and the, and the people leading them, the men and women leading them, are told that they're creating value. So of course you should take these, these classes. Um, and of course then on the ground, inside the businesses, they of course want to be investing in their capabilities and their competencies. They are proud to be risk takers. They're even proud sometimes when they fail. Look, we failed, we didn't care, we got up again, and uh, 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 you know, that is what entrepreneurship is, right? Willingness to take risks, not being risk averse. You're proud to do that. And so you should also learn about how to think about that, risk taking, portfolios. You welcome uncertainty, you don't fear it. You know things might be hard and you kind of brag about that process. You learn from trial and error. The, the problem is not failure, but it's getting up again and learning from those mistakes. You make strategic choices, you direct the company. And again, that's one of the main things you learn in these strategic management classes. And if you listen to Steve Jobs, and, and he gave this very inspirational talk to the uh, 2005 Stanford uh, graduating class, you have to be hungry and foolish, a bit crazy, right? You don't want to become boring, God forbid. If a business leader is seen as boring, that is going to kill the company. You've got to be hungry and foolish and cool and constantly reinvent yourself in the company. These are all correct things. If you want to be creating value, you should be doing all these things. So I'm not making fun of any of these uh, uh, statements here. This is what you should be doing if you want to be a wealth creator. The problem is that if we don't understand that value is in fact collective, and you do have lots of different actors co-creating value, co-creating markets, and you only mythologize some, and think that others are just there, again, to enable, to facilitate, to redistribute existing value, whether it's progressive redistribution or regressive, then you wouldn't bother. You wouldn't bother. You would increasingly disinvest, potentially, from those processes because all you need to really be doing is fixing some sort of background conditions, horizontal framework conditions. And for sure, you better not be a risk taker. Do not fail. And if you do, you're out. You will be, not on the third page of the Daily Mail, on the front page, uh, saying just how stupid you were for making this terrible mistake. And in fact, this is where the term that some of you might be familiar with, picking winners, comes from. As soon as you have something like the Concord plane that is not flying, but uh, received lots of different types, sorry, I'm trying to get a cup here, uh, public investment, but it's not flying, you're, you're told, why did you do that? Why did you bother making a plane? You're a private actor. You should have just you know, facilitated that, invested in some education and some research, and don't pick. Don't pick a technology. Don't pick a company. Don't pick a sector. Don't pick a direction. Just facilitate things and let the directions occur and be set by the wealth creators. Um, and so what happens is you start believing this. Even people in this room, including myself, often use these words. And then I always say, oh, whoops, I wasn't supposed to say that, given that I just lectured people against that word. The term intervention. How many of us use the word intervention in positive ways? Well, we should have this policy intervention to do that or the other thing. If we say markets are co-created and co-shaped by different actors, the word intervention actually makes no sense to say that policy is intervening in something called the market. Policy is co-shaping, co-creating that. Again, these words de-risking, we use it all the time that, you know, in order to get this really difficult thing done, whether it's infrastructure or a great new energy project, we might say we need the public sector to de-risk that process. Forgetting actually the history, in this case of energy, 
uh, innovation where you often had public actors absolutely actively taking risks, acting as an investor, a first resort, not just a lender of last resort. Uh, level the playing field, horizontal conditions, framework conditions, again, anyone familiar with the European Com Commission will know lots about these framework conditions. All important, so this is why it's difficult sometimes to say these things, you actually also have to do these things. You have to facilitate, you probably do have to do risk, you probably do have to in some cases level and make sure that there is a, a playing field where everyone can in theory start off in the right, uh, uh, in the same conditions. There's all sorts of different types of market failures, but this notion that at best what you're doing is fixing something called a market failure is what I want to argue is incredibly problematic. I usually spend a whole 30 minutes just on that point, but this notion that again you have a market and sometimes it screws up and we know we've just lived through a massive mess up which was the financial crisis, it's not to say that those market failures don't exist, but this notion that the policy process is just there to fix a problem in the market is incredibly unuseful actually to steer and to shape economies and markets in ways that actually achieve these big ambitions around things like smart, inclusive, and sustainable uh, growth. Market failures, by the way, in our area, like in David Price's area, innovation, the classic market failure would be when you have a positive externality where different types of actors will be benefiting from a particular type of investment, like knowledge, and so you have underinvestment in, the, uh, in, in, in things like basic science, and so the public sector invests in basic science more than the private sector. It would be foolish to say that's not a good point. The point is that it would be very hard, for example, to understand the history of technological change, technological revolutions, which have been at the heart of capitalist growth processes for the last 200 years, if you just saw this process of coming in and fixing something like a public good problem in the case of knowledge or negative externalities like pollution coming in and fixing them through something called the carbon tax. Um, these market failures exist, but they are talked about, the discourse, the narrative around the policy making process as just fixing something versus actively shaping and creating it is what I want to argue is incredibly limited. And we need a different framework, a different framework which I like to call market shaping, market co-creating. But we shouldn't forget that those kind of notions that you're just fixing, you're fixing something also then brings up all sorts of fear. What happens when government comes in and fixes something? It might actually mess things up even more. So there's a whole body of thought that I won't go into here, but it's called public choice theory and on the ground it's basically called new public management that has convinced civil servants to be extremely careful. Be careful because you're so easily corruptible, there's all sorts of capture, there's also problems within bureaucracies. Be careful because actually this unfortunately is the lowest sentence here that some of you can't see. Government failures, government messing up when it comes in to put a patch here and there might actually be even worse than market failures. And that on top of this notion that actually at best what the public sector can do in terms of how it does things, the process of policy making and how public organizations are run, it should be somehow imitating the efficiency and the cost benefit metrics that are used in the private sector leads to also seeing the citizens that are being supposed to be served, if you want, by the public as customers and clients. It becomes something quite useful to think let's cut here and there, let's literally shed some load. Load shedding is, is a word that's actually used, believe it or not, um, from a different institution because we don't want this thing called the public to be too big and too clumsy, be as nimble as possible, again, fix things and then get out of the way so there's no real reason that you should be too dynamic and large. Outsourcing, as we know, has been a, a very strong uh, a tendency and trend in recent years in terms of thinking that you might as well, again, just stick to the basics and then outsource different types of activities like IT to the private sector. Uh, uh, the NSA scandal, the whole Snowden affair, in some ways could be interpreted um, as being a result of the US government having outsourced IT. By the way, it would be foolish to think that you shouldn't outsource anything. Uh, the University of Sussex, where I was before, there was a big debate on campus on whether it was correct or not to have outsourced the catering structure 
of the university. And the students made, uh, 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 well, they had a big debate about that. Now, one could argue that perhaps if you're outsourcing catering, that's not going to completely dismount to the university. But if you're outsourcing within a public institution, the things that actually does, the things that go to its core, and I think Mike Bracken will soon talk about this in terms of just how important it is, for example, with IT to actually be developing internally the capacities and the capabilities for doing that, that could become a, a big problem. Um, anyway, so what's interesting is that even on the left, even the progressives have to some extent bought into this. Um, now, I'm not saying Stiglitz has completely, but this is very interesting in a book that he wrote, The Economics of the Public Sector. He says, there's a compelling argument actually against public production, the public actually doing stuff, creating directly value beyond, if you want, facilitating that value creation. Often governments, in fact, seem to be quite inefficient producers. Um, equally, I would argue that the way that Keynes has been misunderstood by some modern day Keynesians is also um, a result of this. Seeing the role of the public spend as simply being necessary when things go bad in the sense of a recession, right? So the need for counter cyclical investment, counter cyclical spending through government, of course, we know that's very important, but it would be very hard to see the history of some very important changes where the public was important if you just view it as have come in, have come in to fix the business cycle problem. Right? In fact, the investments that I wrote about in the entrepreneurial state, which are basically all the things in your iPhones that make it smart, don't worry, I won't do that part of the story, you've heard it before, actually occurred in the boom. It was uh, not in order to fix the recession problem. So we need a theory. When should the public do something? When should it do it? How should it do it? Is it just fixing or is there something else? Um, and this, this notion, I've been talking quite a bit about words, right? so leveling, fixing, um, uh, just being there to de-risk. These are stories, right? I mean, we can pretend that there's theories behind it, and there are. There's actually quite a lot of mathematical uh, uh, equations behind lots of the market failure apparatus, but this has actually constructed quite a story, a discourse, a way that we talk about public institutions. And if I had to say what the aim is of our institute, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, is to really rethink that story, that story which has been guided by problematic theories, and we want to rethink the theory, we are not just going to be storytelling. It has translated into very specific frameworks that are, are guiding departments of health, departments of energy, departments of defense, departments of education, and how these departments interact or not interact. I am extremely lucky to be co-directing this institute with Reiner Cattell, who's joined us on September 1st. Where are you, Reiner? Somewhere. There you are. Um, from Estonia. Reiner is, is one of the international leaders in rethinking the term bureaucracy. Why do we think bureaucracy is a bad word? Oh, that's bureaucratic. We could construct the coolest, funky, hungry and foolish bureaucracies that are dynamic and capable to learn, capable to change, capable precisely because they're investing in their capabilities and capacities. And it's very hard to do that with these existing frameworks. So having a active market making, market shaping uh, framework, which then says, ooh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to shape? How are we going to how are we going to co-create value? How are we going to uh, uh, co-create markets? Requires agency, as I began with. And it requires going, you know, talking about public and talking about the public good. There's nothing wrong with the word public good, except how it's been used actually to constrain the imagination of what can be done. Think of what happened with the BBC, and Roly Keating is here. He's on our advisory board. Many people are here from our advisory board. I'm extremely lucky to have such a dynamic and exciting one. Rowley uh, will know from his work at the BBC, even though now he's at the British Library, that actually the way the term public good was used, for example, in the charter review for the BBC, was to almost constrain what it was able to do. This notion that you're allowed to create documentaries about giraffes in Africa, you are allowed to do you know, high quality news programs, but do not do soap operas and talk shows, that's for business. Right? That sort of misses the point that independent of the format, literally in this case the format, because we're talking about television, um, independent of the format, the point of the public is not to say, okay, this slice of the pizza 
because I'm Italian, the, people, the, the market uh, is yours, and this, you know, these slices are for business, but actually how do we actively change the shape, change the direction, co-create this thing that we're trying to um, uh, 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 well, shape, as opposed to you know, independent of the format, but with the notion of public value, even through the soap operas, even through the talk shows. Similarly, if you look at public banks, that are out there, there's some very active ones in the energy landscape. This notion that at best they should just be helping to construct some infrastructure in the country or help some ailing firms versus, for example, what the KFW has done in Germany and then been nailed for it precisely because we don't have these sort of frameworks of directionality and agencies in the public actively shaping and redirecting credit and finance in Germany to fulfill the energy vent policy. And by the way, what's very interesting in Germany is that this energy vent policy has been absolutely mission-oriented. It has not been focused on sectors like renewable energy, but greening through a public value perception the entire economy. So even steel, even steel has had to rethink itself and lo massively lower its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle in Germany because there was this uh, uh, a strong um, purpose, if you want, that was set from... Uh, from above, but having also been basically a result of decades of civil society in Germany arguing that green was the right direction. We should be learning from these experiences and not see public goods as just corrections of a market failure, but actually as objectives to, uh, to reach and the policy process, Albert Hirschman often talked about this, policy as a process, giving a lot of attention to what it means for actually the process uh, uh, dynamics. So public purpose is about thinking about public with a direction, not just facilitating, not just enabling, actually having a purpose that one could talk about in terms of a mission, one could also talk about it in terms of a vision, but where that comes from, is this just set by a dictator or an inspirational uh, leader of a particular organization? No, public purpose and policy as process in the Albert Hirschman way must be going hand in hand. This is not, as actually Michael Arthur said very eloquently, about public versus private. This is about partnerships. But unless we rethink, revitalize, reinvest in the capacity making of the public, as opposed to outsourcing um, the capacities as we have seen over time, it's going to be extremely hard to develop these partnerships. Um, and the mission-oriented thinking, I think, is extremely important because when we look at the history of missions, whether it was going to the moon or um, um, uh, you know, this energy vend uh, policy that I just mentioned before, um, what, what we learn is just how much, in fact, uh, 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 by having a directed purpose, by actually going for something directly versus thinking you just have to facilitate it through things like tax incentives, that actually gets business excited. Now, this, this word excitement, you shouldn't sort of laugh at it. This isn't about just, you know, let's sound exciting. One of the biggest problems we have today in modern day capitalism is actually the lack of business investment. There's lots of hoarding. There's lots of financialization, as I mentioned in the beginning. How to unlock private investment, precisely also to get more co-investment between public and private, is key. And one of the interesting lessons, and this is just sort of a very detailed point, but incredibly important one in terms of how we design policies, coming back to the importance of design, is that looking at the uh, role that mission-oriented, strategic, investor of first resort, not lender of last resort investments, have actually had in eventually getting business to come in and decide that it's actually interesting to be thinking about something like whether it's biotech, nanotech, or the green revolution today. Um, but within these organizations, and, and this is some of the work that we've been doing for some time and some of the research fellows who've joined IAPP recently are looking specifically within some classic mission-oriented organizations. It's very interesting, in fact, to see how they describe their own processes. It's very hard to find any public organization that has, in fact, tried to be purposeful to see how it uh, describes itself simply in terms of fixing different market failures. They have missions, but how to actually enable then this uh, attention that we're giving to the need for mission-orientedness to change then how we think about literally government, how we think about public sector in terms of an alternative 
through this public choice and new public management understanding of, uh, of how to organize bureaucracies, as I was mentioning that Rainer um, looks at, is incredibly important. So when I, um, oops, sorry, when I spoke to, um, ah, go backwards, to Cheryl Martin, who was one of the first directors of ARPA-E within the Department of Energy, she was very clear. She said, in order to be mission-oriented, when we think of ourselves with a purpose, we are actually going to have to trip and fall and make quite a few mistakes. In fact, we evaluate our success precisely through that process, how many risks we were willing to take, but then how much the successes actually impacted the economy. And when she introduced me um, at an ARPA-E convention where I gave a keynote, she was quite funny. She, I had even read this article. It was a Forbes article where she said that they had described me as basically saying things that were heretical to everything that Forbes had stood for for 96 years. Um, and I said to her, but actually what you do, what you do within ARPA-E actually is antithetical to what we hear every day. For example, I think just that week there had been a front cover of The Economist saying that for a green revolution, all we needed governments to do was stick to the basics, invest in skills, some infrastructure, and then get out of the way and let the revolutionaries do their thing. So when you look within mission-oriented organizations, and do not think just of high tech, don't think of technology, think of those organizations in the healthcare industry, those organizations in the educational industry that have actually really rethought themselves and in that process rethought their landscapes, they had to take risks. They had to absolutely learn by you know, pivoting every now and then, evaluating what they were doing dynamically in terms of the different spillovers also that they were creating through a particular policy, perhaps then also changing their minds along the way. But how those dynamic evaluation techniques are structured, why you should even bother uh, uh, taking a risk and be willing to do it is absolutely uh, uh, connected to the theory of what we think the public sector is for in the first place. One of the most exciting things we're doing right now, we just started last month in the Institute, is working closely with the UN's um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, thinking about how we can actually use lessons from mission-oriented policies to uh, create road mapping. I don't like that word because it sounds too linear, but let's just use it for now. Road mapping to actually achieve the sustainable development goals. Because this is a real opportunity. These are goals that have actually been signed up to by more than 100 countries. Beneath them, there's about 150 targets. How to structure economies, uh, and, and often at the city level, I think Dan will hopefully talk to us about some cities in just a minute, and I will finish because I think I'm one minute over, um, how to restructure particular policies so that they are actually geared up to solving concrete targets, concrete missions over a five or seven year period that can actually fulfill an ambition which is as uh, concrete as some of these sustainable development goals and the targets underneath them are incredibly important. And we shouldn't forget that both green and care can become you know, broadly defined ways, in fact, to redirect economies. And many of these SDGs are, in fact, talking about both care and sustainability. Industrial policy, which is back for the first time in many years, could also be redirected very much, not in terms of thinking about sectors, but getting lots of different sectors to work together on concrete problems uh, uh, that are targeting, that are results of uh, you know, thinking about mission orientation and the SDGs and, and the targets beneath them. Barack Obama said something fantastic, which is we live and do business in the information age, but the last major reorganization of the government happened in the age of black and white TV. So what we would like to do very much in IIPP is to absolutely rethink government in the age of the digital revolution, but not to use that as a way to, uh, to pretend that some actors who are more digitally enhanced are going to be important, but literally to rethink completely the frameworks that are guiding today what civil servants actually do. Um, I'm not going to go through these at any extent, but we've been talking about these recently as ROAR. It's quite convenient that it comes from uh, uh, you know, what lions do, and the cover of the entrepreneurial state had a lion and a pussycat from a quote that Keynes uh, wrote to Roosevelt when he said, uh, we'd like to think that you know, out there we have lots of actors that are lions, wolves, and tigers, but actually we have lots of pussycats. We have domesticated animals. How to get different actors in the economy excited to be co-creating and co-shaping markets together, thinking about opportunities, something that Alan Penn said yesterday in a meeting we had, 
thinking about opportunities requires a different framework. So the four questions that we are using in IAPP to both direct some of the research that we have, and you have, I think, all uh, one of our flyers that have some of the eight uh, sort of research streams, but very much the way that we are trying to engage with different organizations through a network that we have called the Mission Oriented Innovation Network, where we have sharing between 30 organizations across the world, which we've identified as being mission oriented and having tried at least to actively shape their environments are around these four questions. How to get over the problem of picking winners and admit you have to pick, you have to make choices, how to make those choices at the same time of enabling and um, nurturing bottom-up experimentation. So directing the economy in a green way or in a care way, what does that mean? How to invest within the organizational capacity so you're nurturing that explorative process and policy as process and able to uh, create these hungry and foolish bureaucracies. Um, assessment, how do we actually get over the cost-benefit metrics that continue to guide so much of the ways that we think about efficiency within the public sector and actually construct concretely metrics that are more dynamic and actually capture these spillovers. That's why outside, by the way, when you go to have the drink as well as inside your packets with the uh, postcards, we've written words and then crossed them out and proposed a, di uh, a different uh, word. So not picking winners, picking willings, not picking the willing, those that are willing to engage with you, not cost benefit, but dynamic spillovers. And rewards, this is not just about smart, inclusive, sustainable growth, this is absolutely about sharing both risks and rewards through very concrete instruments, very concrete negotiation, very concrete ways to uh, uh, come to the table equally confident that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, what are the ways that people have done this across the world in different organizations, whether it's been, again, through particular IPR schemes, I'm done, <laughs> or particular um, uh, 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 conditions around reinvestment, so the public does this, but then profits are reinvested in order to do that. Uh, again, uh, patents themselves being uh, uh, something that needs to be negotiated and one of the big problems with patents nowadays is that they are increasingly upstream and that's a failure of negotiation. We're actually patenting the tools for research. We have a great collaboration with the RSA using this framework as a pilot within particular cities, particular cities that are thinking about green. Um, and I'm just going to finish by saying goodbye before the uh, discussion, but MOIN, this word, Mission Oriented Innovation Network, that we are establishing, we just launched it actually yesterday with one of our first meetings with our partners, means hello. And it means hello, and what is very important for us as researchers is not to go lecture to policymakers around the world about the usefulness of our theory, but to actively co-create this new framework by first in the first six to nine months, we just want to listen. We want to hear, for example, how the picking winners, how the crowding out arguments have actually been experienced within particular organizations as different from the BBC and ARPA-E. So thank you very much. And can I just say thank you especially to all the uh, incredible people that have actually made this because I'm not sure if we're going to remember to do it later. So Gemma, Linda, Sarah, Anne, Rainer, Manfred, and Philippa, thank you very much for organizing this entire event today. Well, good evening. My name is John Thornhill. I'm the Innovation Editor at the Financial Times, and it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here this evening at the launch of this uh, great in institute for innovation and public purpose. As my job title suggests, I have a great interest in uh, the subject and have long admired Mariana's thought-provoking contributions in this field. As she writes, there is so much mythology around on this subject, and I think uh, Mariana is an extraordinary myth buster, as we have just heard in her great speech tonight. Now, we're joined by a terrific panel to discuss some of the issues that Mariana has raised this evening and debate the role that uh, the Institute can play. Um, these three gentlemen all have something in common as well, not just facial hair, uh, which is that they all serve on the advisory board of the IIPP, and so they have, to use Mariana's rhetoric, a market-shaping role in the Institute. Um, Dan Hill, on my left here, is an associate director of Arab and head of its digital studio. He is a designer and urbanist who has worked in Australia, Finland, and Italy, as well as the UK. And he is also, most importantly, a visiting professor at the Bartlett School. Mike Bracken is a partner at Public Digital, which advises governments 
around the world about digital transformation. He previously played an inspirational role in co-founding and running the government digital service, which has served as a model for public sector innovation around the world. Uh, and on my left, we have Professor Right, uh, we have Professor James Galbraith, who holds the Lloyd Benson Chair in Government Business Relations at the University of Texas, Austin. Jamie runs the University of Texas's Inequality Project and is also the author of several books, including The Predator State, How Conservatives Abandon the Free Market, and Why Liberals Should Do So Too. <laughs> now, Dan, I am going to start with you. And in particular, I'd like you to respond to what Mariana was saying in her speech in particular from your experience of working, uh, trying to shape um, uh, public sector, particularly in your role at Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to rattle through this rather quickly. I'll try not to stand in front of it, I suppose. That would be a start. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm sort of often working in this space here. Um, in the city governments, often in national governments or national concepts like CITRA, the Finnish Innovation Fund, now Arab often working with um, governments like the municipality in Amsterdam or the Great London Authority, and really trying to pull these together. And this is been part of what the public sector innovation movement has done a lot of in the last five, ten years or so. This is squeezing those together so that policy making can be informed by the insights you receive from delivery the front end of things, how policies get enacted in places, and equally how the execution of delivery is absolutely fundamental to a successful policy. Previously, they were too far apart. Some things have led that, made that possible. Technology is one of them. Um, but in design and practice engaging with governance and public policy making is another. And just the complexity of the challenges we're facing means that we can't simply face them in the old simplistic, separated ways where we can think rather hard about things in a room and then assume that they'll get delivered and things will happen. Um, so for example, things that are changing at the moment. Sorry. This is a nice example from San Francisco. The, the sewers need upgrading in San Francisco because of America. Um, climate change, nonetheless, uh, uh, and excessive rainwater has led to the sewers being inappropriate for what San Francisco needs. They're going to issue a $1.5 billion bond to upgrade those sewers. Uh, Nicholas de Moncho, who is a professor at Berkeley, figured out instead you could, instead of upgrading the sewers, just plant 1,500 small um, copses of trees around the same region. That would prevent the water going down the sewers in the first place. And you have effectively 96% the same effect. For about half the money, 700 million instead. And you get trees, which means you can grow lemons because of California, that uh, they usually get heat island effects, they clean the air, kids can play in them and they don't, in the way that you don't really want kids playing in sewers, usually. Um, so it's a much better solution, but much harder from a traditional government perspective. It's actually very easy to, in a way, write the bond issue for $1.5 billion. It seems to them quite hard to do 1,500 small distributed plots. In reality, it's not. It's just the way that we've organized things. So it would mean that distributed model and participative approach working with communities. Those tools exist, those practices exist, just not in government as it's been enacted recently. Um, I'll skip this because the video is playing. I didn't expect that. It's PowerPoint. <laughs> um, autonomous shuttles, the kind of which you're about to see in the background, could replace MIT and ETH and Zurich in about 80% of private car use in cities. Cities like Singapore or New York or Zurich region and so on. That could radically transform some of the issues we have, like this city in London, where basically everybody's breathing toxic air and the city's congested. If we make the right decisions, if we make the wrong decisions, we'd absolutely be deleterious. We could add to the congestion. We could destabilize public transport. All kinds of um, negative outcomes could happen. Super local renewable energy, as in photovoltaic cells on people's roofs, or the equivalent of numerous ways of doing that, with battery storage in the basement, could radically transform the way we generate energy and store energy locally. And indeed, this project in Perth, Australia, just shares the energy at the scale of the grid. It's effectively, instead of a national grid, it's a microgrid at that scale, owned by the community. Very, very interesting. That's uh, energy without energy companies, if you like. Um, and finally, this idea of cooperative housing. 15% uh, of Berlin housing stock every year is now being built by cooperatives. 25 to 30 percent of all housing in Zurich, billion to 30 percent by 2025, designed and owned 
by cooperatives. Working with architects and so on, it tends to be 25, 30% cheaper than market um, levels without any real public subsidy. It's affordable, it's far more sustainable usually than the market produces because if you're designing your own house, why would you not make it sustainable? Because you're picking up the running costs. Super interesting model. So all of these models exist. The question is, what do we do about that? So we're seeing interesting public leadership emerging. I'm really impressed actually by this quote by Jean-Louis Miska, the deputy mayor of Paris. In the context of autonomous vehicles, so the shuttles I talked about, or <coughs> private versions of AVs, so if we don't design the rules of the game, we as the city of Paris, before 2020, it'll be a mess. We should announce that no private owned autonomous vehicle will be allowed. It will only be mobility as a service, as a new call it, it comes to you. Conceivably community owned, shared, cooperatively owned, publicly owned, a form of public transport, all of those are options. That's really impressive for a deputy mayor to get on the front foot about the kind of thing. We need to decide what's right for Paris and its citizens before Mercedes-Benz or Tesla decide what's right for them in terms of Paris. Uh, this is super interesting. It shows we can co-opt the technology. City Mapper, uh, a London-based startup which uh, made a very successful app, which is probably on half the phones in the room. They just launched a bus service because their data from the app showed a gap in TFL, Transport for London, service. They said to TFL, can we launch a bus there? Incredibly interesting. But look at the way they announce it. This is co-opting the technology and reframing it in this case in the European context. Silicon Valley, it's a social hyper-local multi-passenger pool vehicle. Most of the rest of the world, it's a bus. <laughs> we, we know what buses are, you know. And in Silicon Valley, the folks that make apps don't really know what buses are. They might see them occasionally in the distance, but they don't tend to exist for them. So it's just a bus, but it's enabled in a completely new way. And it, it's incredibly interesting as well. It shows this kind of technology can be co-opted into a, in this case, it derives a, you derive a public good from it. And then this question of how do you reorganize? This is fascinating as well. Helsinki City Council, so the sort of Barack Obama quote, just reorganized last year from 34 different departments, which is typical of most city councils, to four on the basis that that's a better shape to address 21st century problems or opportunities, challenges, basically. They did this for full, you know, full Nordic brownie points after an 18-month co-design process with citizens, um, as they do because they're Finns. And it's incredibly interesting. I mean, it's still shaking out. There'll still be some, a lot of blood on the walls that still needs cleaning up after that kind of shift. But that's the kind of shift we're talking about. And it's a redesign, effectively, of the form of government. Uh, in central government, it's fascinating. The, I think about a decade ago, or maybe 2011, when you started your work, Mike, there would have been a handful, or you said to me a minute ago, zero designers employed by central government. There are now 800, which is extraordinary. The, the inspirational work of GDS has then blossomed across the Home Office and numerous aspects of uh, central government. That's an incredible strategic capability at the heart of government, man. But look at what it means for architecture. So leaving aside the digital delivery, in 1970, about 50% of the architects in the country were employed by the public sector. Now it's 0.7%, 0.1% in London. That's a massive strategic loss by design intelligence leached out of the public sector. The kind of thing we had before London County Council was a generator of talent, extraordinary generator of talent, actually. shapes generations of architects. Uh, that's not happening now. This thing, it was relaunched on Kickstarter recently, it was the British Rail Corporate Identity Panel. It's a beautiful piece of work, extraordinary public design. We didn't know how to deliver it then because we didn't have things like service designers and stuff that we do now. Actually, we could enact this and make it work in a way that we arguably couldn't by then. But we need that strategic capability back. So again, 52, 53, you have 1,500 architects in London County Council Architects Department, or, or roughly, roughly that. Now we have a, an absolute handful in there. So finally, the questions I, I'd ask as well. Can we do this thing about stealing the dynamics of technology? I've talked about malleable or distributed or lightweight technologies without having to import what some people have called the Californian ideology that goes with it. So can we take the tech and reframe it? Or build the tech here in similar ways and build it for our context? Secondly, how do we make the case for addressing the 21st century in its own, on its own terms, using organizational methods and forms that, like the Helsinki switch that I talked about, how do we make the case for that, recognizing they are different challenges? Thirdly, the public value of this thing, and Mariana talks about this, of course, um, my, my work is in cities, the, the things I talked about, they're in co-op and energy and mobility and 
housing, how do they create new kinds of values, make new kinds of cities? Because we desperately need to make new kinds of cities, a number of reasons. How does the local ownership of those things, through co-ops, turn the economics upside down? Actually, we're making it cheaper, but conceivably reducing GDP might be better. That's, that's, we don't really have a language for that kind of thing. We're taking energy at the low, super local level, it's effectively free energy. How does that work? And finally, could this actually, all of these things, the design practice we're talking about, actually enable a rebirth of sort of public service design, as we saw a little bit in the 50s and the 70s and the 80s. We see it with GDS that Michael will talk about in a moment. So that actually enables us to get right on the front foot and be ambitious and innovative. Uh, and you know, echoing Mariana's, Mariana's words, be really ambitious about that kind of work at the core of government. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan. I mean, I think that's a really interesting uh, the shift in focus looking at city government, and I think that's an issue I'd like to come back to in just a minute. So, Mike, over to you. Um, thank you. Um, it's a bit like many of us in the room. Oh, hello. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's very good timing. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to be really quick. I spent like many others. I sort of want the loo soon anyway, so we'll all need to go. Um, I'm Mike Bracken. The, the GDS thing has been mentioned a few times. Can I just ask, show of hands, who knows what it is? Yeah, more, less than... Mm, yeah. I'll just do a little bit of exposition for those who don't. Um, I'm a uh, founder of Public Digital. I'm a visiting professor here uh, at IOPP. Um, and what we do is this, sort of help big governments and big institutions who work at scale in the public do sort of the stuff with it, GDS. I only really want to come with two thoughts tonight to support Mariana and build on what Dan said, but I'm going to have to explain a little bit about GDS first quickly. So basically, for a variety of reasons, all of which are too boring to go into, in 2010, the government said, people from the internet, you can come into the middle of government. That is always a really good idea, by the way. If you have ever happened to run a government, get them in the middle. And what does that mean? Well, for a start, our thinking was this. Tom Loosemore, my colleague at Public Digital, said, this is what digital means. Applying the culture and practice of technology of the internet era to respond to users' raised expectations. Key word on that slide is users. Because, as my other colleague, Ben Terrett, would say, what government needs to do when you're in government is focus on the people, on the users of services. Users is an important word, non-pejorative. It's users. And he, this is tracing paper in the windows of the office, he ripped out the middle and said, focus on the people outside. And that was our philosophy. Philosophy is up, takes you so far, but you need some principles. And the principles that Marina talked about so well in terms of the current choice thinking, which is so really unhelpful when you're in government, you need to replace with something else. Mm -hmm. Another colleague of ours, Russell Davis, helped shape our thinking into these 10 design principles, which are now being really used around the world in many different areas. They're very simple. Start with needs. Do less. Design with data. They sound very catchy, but underneath them is a wealth of information. If you click on a link, you'll find a paragraph, then a manual, and then a guide, then a procurement list, and finally all the way into the HR process and the review forms. So these principles we put at the top of government in the center and flowed all the way through. Your favorite website, gov.uk, is something that we created. Uh, and we did that so that one simple point was that users, when they were dealing with government, needed to know that it was government they were dealing with. Prior to this, over 3,000 websites all looked different. What government was saying to us as users is, you have to learn how we have organized ourselves in order to deal with government. That's an insanely arrogant way of running a government. We then went on to reform 25 of the most important transactions in government. Got about 21 of those out. Uh, there are quite a lot. We had to count them at the start. 1.3 billion transactions in central government, about over 600 services. What I really want to talk to you about today is markets. If I'd just shown this slide and not told you that lot, you wouldn't have understood how we got here. So we're trying to reform these, all, all these services. And the critical point was, well, what does the market look like? Everyone in government was telling me, well, you know, what does the market say? So I had a look at this market, mm -hmm. and helpfully in 2011, our parliament produced a report which described the technology supply chain for government services as, as an oligopoly. And like all good economists here in this room, you know what follows an oligopoly, which is a cartel. 
Those blue dots on a map represent 84% of the purchasing of government technology services in 2011. That's a £16 billion pound bill going to seven dots on a map. Modesty forbids me saying which companies live at those blue dots, but I can guess, you can guess too. Three years later, it looks like this. The blue dots aren't to scale by value. There are now 3,500 small and medium enterprises, digital companies, technology companies, participating in the government's supply chain of digital services. That market did not just happen. The market had stopped that happening very well for 20 years. That had to be designed. We had to think about it. We needed a philosophy, we needed principles. That's what we did. We designed it. We won Design of the Year in 2013. You can't enter that thing. You get given it by designers like Dan. Well, not Dan, <laughs> but by designers. And we beat Thomas Heatherwick's cauldron, which is always nice. The point about it is our design, you can design markets. The G Cloud, this thing I've shown you, GDS itself as an institution was designed. And I think it's one of the few bits of evidence for what Mariana is saying is we can do this and do it at light speed as well. How do you do it? You write your own rules quickly. The last message I have to give, and I'm very aware of your sign, is this, is that these are all the rules we created. You will be called, if you try and do this, a disruptor, because you're disrupting markets. What you're actually doing is creating and designing new markets. And to do that, you have to write a lot of rules. To write a lot of rules, you need some help. And the biggest thing I didn't have in government, I had loads of help, loads of brilliant civil servants, loads of external help. The biggest thing I didn't help was economists. Because, seriously, because there was nowhere to go. There was no underpinning economic model that I could look at and say, this looks like that thing that we're doing. It was quite lonely. Now, the outcome was clear to see. These are treasury figures, not mine. We actually saved a lot more than this, but treasury being what they like, you know. But the point is, if we could do that very quickly in a system set up to not do this, think what could happen to governments if we had an underpinning economic model and an institution that was there to support people who were trying to do this. That reason alone is why I fully support this institution. I think it's absolutely vital that we, 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 we uh, succeed and Mariana succeeds. Obama wrote me a nice letter. Nice. <laughs> Everyone should have one of them. But the critical thing is, the thing that we did is now recognized elsewhere around the world, but is now becoming the new normal. Governments around the world have got one of these things. All look a bit different, but generally the model is good. Now, what, what, what was one thing I learned about governments everywhere, because I'm going to Paraguay on Monday talking to them, is all governments are the same, they're roughly the same thing. And they're fast followers. So if you get this right, everyone will do it. So that's why this institution is so important, because it can become a global institution for all the people around the world who are trying to change governments in this way. That's it from me. Thank you. Thanks Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike. Now, we've had a terrific exposition of the kind of theoretical aspects of what we're talking about tonight. We've had a great exposition of the practical. And I wondered if I could ask Jamie if you could help draw together both of these themes and also to help set some of the priorities from the Institute. Thanks very much indeed. And it's a very great pleasure to say a few words tonight at the launch of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, headed with style and imagination by Mariana Masucato, as in all she does. And I want to add also a special word of congratulations on uh, the Leontief Prize. Vasily Leontief was my first the professor of economics, about the first course I ever took in the subject. Uh, he was an eminent realist. I know that in 1929 he took a balloon up uh, to help plot the paths of railways in China. So there is something that was not being done strictly by markets. Uh, he was also my, my father's closest friend on the Harvard Economics faculty. Um, and I uh, think he would be pleased to have you as the recipient of a prize in his name. Well, I know what innovation is, or I think I do, uh, but what is public purpose? A Precise definition may escape us, but that old definition of smut, I know it when I see it, probably won't quite do. Let's reach back. When John Maynard Keynes, in the Economic Consequences of the Peace, wrote of Victorian Britain, 
and its ethos of thrift and investment of the double bluff that held both capitalist consumption and workers' wages in check, he wrote that in its way society knew what it was about, evoking with that phrase a common psychology that fits an instinctive view of public purpose. Four decades later, my father struggled with this theme uh, with the uh, concept of countervailing power, uh, with the problem of social balance, what he called the relationship between private affluence and public squalor uh, in the affluent society, with the planning system in the new industrial state, and with a book that was entitled Economics and the Public Purpose that was published in 1973, by which time the counter-revolution was already well underway. In modern so-called mainstream economics, regulation is a burden. Taxes are distortions. The civil service is at best unproductive or worst corrupt, a pestilence if not a curse. The public sector, if it provides anything, it is public goods, something that can be weighed by the same quanta of economic value as anything else, and therefore traded off against the privately provided goods. Now, there was something to this vision in the 18th century um, when you know, there were basically two departments of government, a department of internal looting called taxation, and a department of external looting, which was called the Navy. Uh, but in the 19th century, industrialism interposed new technologies, large producers, distance and networks uh, between workers and consumers, the two aspects of the economic person. And within just a few decades, five or six decades at the most, the entire edifice of untrammeled capitalism collapsed. The food was tainted. The medicines were either ineffective or lethal, and the factories burned down with scores of their workers still inside. The entire banking system and the stock jobbing economy fell to the ground as speculation turned into panic to the point where, let us remember, half the world turned toward communism as a arguably better alternative perhaps not here at UCL, but at Cambridge when I was there in the 1970s, the story was that uh, the question had been posed to your fellow Italian expatriate, uh, Piero Sraffa, Piero, were you the fourth man? To which he replied, I can no longer remember which number I was. <laughs> the 20th century, however, proved that there was indeed another path, another choice. It proved that social insurance, universal social insurance, provided through government in a way that was administered and extremely economically, that this brings health, that this brings longevity. It's one of the great discoveries of the social security system that it was really supply side economics. You pay people on a monthly basis to keep on living. They respond to the incentive, and so they do. That. Uh, Progressive taxes limiting the extent of inequality, estate taxes limiting the, the creation of dynasties, that these things bring and preserve social peace. And above all, the 20th century proved that in the modern world, there are no markets of any consequence without regulation. This is just part of a basic biophysical principle that applies at all levels of organization. The level of the human body, especially when you reach my age and that of some of the others in the room, I look at my colleague from California, uh, <laughs> you find that if you don't regulate your blood pressure, you run into problems. If you don't keep oil in your crankcase or water flowing through your reactor, you run into problems. Uh, and if you don't keep good regulatory control over your banks and bankers, exactly the same thing happens. They blow up. 
public purpose in a nutshell. But there's more. A democratic and reasoned society has the capacity, must have the capacity, to make choices and to set goals, to end unemployment, to make health care a universal right, to prevent nuclear war, to hold the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere under 450 parts per million and climate change, global warming, below 2 degrees Celsius. This, too, is public purpose. And once the society agrees and sets to these goals through a legitimate mechanism, then it's incumbent upon public purpose to set the framework uh, for the economy to function. Thinking about these questions is about language. It's about asserting the meaning of words and that words, in fact, have meaning, which this phrase, public purpose, actually does. So when a long time ago, far, far away, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher declared that there was no such thing as society, she had it precisely wrong. And it is time, it is well past time, to reclaim public purpose and to use the idea to define without apologies the tasks that are before us. That is why the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose IIPP is the right thing at the right moment. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Professor Galbraith. I wondered if I could just flip this straight back to Mariana, um, because uh, I think one of the interesting things that has come out here is uh, we often think that the central governments now, particularly in the two countries represented on this panel, amongst the panelists of the UK and Britain, uh, the UK and the US are distracted at the moment, uh, in Britain by Brexit and in the US by the latest tweets. Um, and I wondered, Mariana, if, uh, as Dan and Mike were talking about, that a lot of initiative can come at the local government level, at the state level in America. Uh, do you think there's a real possibilities now of kind of market shaping and creating initiatives at that level? So what we're is, is this on? Yeah. What we're trying to do specifically on that is actually structure a platform for learning between particular organizations. You know, the word the state sounds kind of like big brother top down, but actually what the state is is a decentralized network of lots of different public organizations as different of, you know, a public bank, the BBC, a Department of Health, and the organizations within a Department of Health. So that, that sharing process is not happening today. Why is it not happening? Not just because you don't have an institution saying, let's do it. You don't have it also because many institutions don't talk about what they do. You know, one of the things I said in the entrepreneurial state was this irony that the US actually talks like Jefferson, but acts like Hamilton. Now, you know, th that point then was like, you know, let's actually look at what actually got us Silicon Valley, a huge amount of public investment. What are the lessons for that in terms of green? But more specifically, when you look at organizations, even when they're doing cool things, if they can't talk about it, then there's no learning in terms of what they're doing. So Yasma, Public Venture Capital Fund in Israel, which absolutely is not just seeing its role as helping all the SMEs in the country or just facilitating innovation, but has actually structured a portfolio, very dynamic portfolio, has thought about risk-taking and how that's different, risk-taking in public versus private, and they don't talk about it, right? Because they have to still pretend that they're just fixing market failures. I won't mention the name, but someone in Israel said to me, Mariana, of course we're doing what you're saying, but we have to pretend that we're fixing markets. So in some ways, what IIPP is, is a coming out of the closet party for lots of these organizations, not to say how great they are, some are great, some are not, lots of them make mistakes, but sharing that experience. And this is incredibly relevant to developing countries, to developed countries, to cities, to regions, to nation states. This is not about, you know, is it the city, is it the nation? It's the, or the organizational capacity and learning what works, what doesn't, but to even talk about it, you need to believe in it. And the problem now is we actually don't believe 
in this kind of collective value creation process is just a facilitating thing. So why talk about this kind of active strategic decision making? Now, one of the issues that um, you raise in your book and also you are talking about here, which I was very pleased to learn about as a journalist, is that storytellers rule the world. That's but on. at the moment, uh, a lot of people are telling the wrong kind of stories. So I'm very interested by thoughts on the panel about how we change the narrative. How do we change stories? So, Mike, do you want to? Um, yeah. So it's a great point. Um, I mean, we had to, at GDS and, and elsewhere, just talk all the time and tell stories, but in a very different way. Government is especially lousy at communicating, uh, despite millions of communications people, because it doesn't actually use the tools of communications that people want to use and consume. So we brought in, you know, as well as designers, people Dan knows, we brought in people from the advertising and, uh, and the service design culture and we had those people communicating. We, we wrote pretty much everything is publicly available on blogs. It's still there now. You can go and find out, should you wish, even the most minute, uh, minutiae uh, of some technical infrastructure or some service design choices were all written about um, openly. And, and communicating in the open and using the tools of the internet to communicate is in and of itself a, a sort of countercultural thing to do. But the great thing about it is it, 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 it both cur it, it's curatable in that it's not, you don't, not something you have to sell a political message. You can write it once and it exists for a long time. People will save it and curate it and reuse it. So for people in positions where you can communicate these sorts of changes, it's vital that you do because the message will go on for a lot longer than you think. Right, Dan, do you have some thoughts on this? Um, I, think, I mean, I think the other thing that's doing is is uh, creating a sense of a public mission around the work and putting that out there uh, as a very clear narrative. That's what you see with GDS and the work that it did, just um, working in public, exposing the seams of the work and the kind of the craft of the work, but doing that very clearly on an official government blog and then speaking at things like this. That meant uh, partly that you get software engineers leaving Google to go and work at the cabinet office, which is. <laughs> words you wouldn't have expected to put in one sentence about 10, 10 years ago, just almost impossible. So, I mean, that, that's really fundamental, this storytelling thing, because the narrative is so skewed the other way, usually, um, that if you're a bright young thing, you know, 22-year-old graduate or whatever, you go and work for McKinsey or Google or whatever. And I think uh, that's some of the work that was going on at the BBC when I was there, when uh, Rowley was there. We were very much working in public as well. Sometimes you get into trouble for that. I remember blogging about when I was at the radio music thing and um, dropping uh, MP3s of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony from Radio 3 onto the internet without really checking with the record industry first, um, which was a very interesting experiment in lots of ways. <laughs> and, uh, but nonetheless, those kinds of maneuvers actually uh, are part of this. It's, re it's really like a hegemonic shift. It's beginning to shift a culture and the way that people think about the work that they do and where they do that. And that, that was, I think, fundamental to the work that you did as well. Right. Um, now, I want to open this up to the, the floor um, because we've got some great people in the audience today who can contribute a lot to this debate. But just before I do that, I wonder, Jamie, could you talk about the different narratives in America? I mean, we clearly have a very uh, clear narrative coming out of Washington at the moment, but there are lots of other narratives coming out of uh, local government, state level as well. So. Well, I'm glad you think that what's coming out of Washington is clear. I'd say, <laughs> okay. I, I, it was news to me. I, well, the word I would have used was uh, uh, abrasive and incoherent. And that, that, <laughs> I suppose there's a certain clarity in that. Uh, I, look, the important thing that happened in the United States in 2016 uh, was that for the first time in maybe 40 years at high level of American politics, a candidate proposed a clear alternative. And that was then, uh, it, it proved to attract a large number of people, and especially young people, to a program that embodied this concept of public purpose. Uh, and I think this is happening, in fact, all over the world. It is not in a way that is immediately uh, going to transform the way uh, you know, our societies are run, uh, but it reflects the fact that history matters uh, and the fact that we came under a particular ideological uh, bent uh, in the 1970s that has lasted for practically my entire adult life uh, has had an effect on how people perceive things and they cannot be fooled indefinitely. 
Uh, and the second thing I'd say is really important is that institutions matter. So that the creation of an institute like this, and hopefully there will be many of them, that this will become something that becomes part of the warp and the woof of, uh, of, of social life and, 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 uh, and discussion about how society should be run, then means that what was driven out of the sphere of dialogue because there was no place to conduct it 40 years ago comes back. And suddenly the society is more diverse, it's more open, and it is more likely to stumble into a successful path uh, than was true before. Right. Now I'd like to open it up to questions from the floor. We have microphones uh, roving around. Uh, please, yeah. please could you um, uh, just say who you are and uh, who your question is directed to. And please, um, rather than reciting your doctoral thesis, if you could just ask a very pointed question or a very precise comment. So who would like to ask a gentleman here? We should have a. Um, what role do we see for the treasury? So, this has to happen at the level of the treasury. Uh, one of the things, even just within a much more narrow topic, uh, which is things like innovation policy or development policy, the actual you know sort of ministries that are in charge of some of the big market shaping areas given that innovation and development are key to uh, driving an economy. One of the huge problems actually has been is that the treasury is here and every now and then a bone is, is, is handed to someone like Vince Cable. Uh, you know, say, you know, so, so you're allowed to do this policy but you know, stay there. And then of course what's driving lots of the economic policy is precisely the kind of theories that don't understand the key drivers of sort of long-term growth. So the, the real problem, for example, with all the deficit stuff was not so much, you know, is austerity good or is austerity bad, but actually the deficit. There's no, there's no uh, proof that it actually even matters. So a country like my own Italy has a very low deficit, has had a very low deficit for 20 years, but has a very high debt to GDP ratio. How can that be? Just ask even, you know, any first year undergrad how that could be, and they're not trained to think that way. So one of the key issues is that when you don't have active public and active private investments, you actually don't get long-run increases in productivity and GDP, and so you have this crazy thing where you might have a low deficit but a very high debt-to-GDP ratio. Something as basic as that, without even talking about public purpose, is not understood by uh, uh, people. And I actually, my big idea, to be honest, in terms of a TV program for this, is a, is a format called Cab Converter. Um, I get into cabs, and in five minutes, I somehow com convert black cabbies, black cab drivers. <laughs> they turn around and they say, no one ever explained it to me that way. Now, um, I'm sort of joking, but not really. We need to find a different type of vocabulary, not just in the way that we've been talking about, but actually opening up, and I think this is why what, what uh, Jamie was just saying is so important, opening up the ability of the public to even understand the key determinants of growth, even when it's badly defined. We all know that GDP is so problematically defined, but there's a complete miscommunication and ignorance out there on some basic things. In this case, it's what a ratio is. So we can move on from James Corden's carpool karaoke to Mariana's cab, cab converter. converter. <laughs> right, um, Michael, Dan, do you have a quick comment on the role of the treasury? Yeah, your last two words in your question were superfluous because it's not what the role is in this, it's what the role is full stop. So if you take the UK as an example, I would contend that it's first you've got to decide what it's for because if you have macro, macroeconomics running the operations of government, if effectively applying that logic to running the finance department of government, then it's not fit for purpose, nor vice versa. So I think the biggest problem that treasuries have got around the world is separating out the operations of government from the macroeconomic policies that it, they are following. And that might sound perverse, but ask anyone who's had to deal with Treasury 
and you just want to cry and go home. And so um, I think that in the UK, it needs uh, a very clear separation of duties. And I suspect the ongoing battles between Treasury and Cabinet Office are so boring, but probably need sorting out quite quickly. Um, I haven't had to work with it like Mike, so I haven't had to cry and go home yet. But um, I, so not the Treasury so much, but I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between the city's finances and the national finances in this country. That's where there's a huge disparity in terms of the ability of a, a mayor or equivalent. We have a couple of mayors. <laughs> I don't know why we don't have more, but uh, to, um, to work with the tax finance raised in their city. So that basically heads centrally. Uh, I think about 85% of it heads centrally from your average UK city. Someone like Paris, the mayor can work with about 85% of the finance raised within the city. They can redistribute accordingly. Now, not to say we should also have 85%, because in this country, we haven't got an equal balance of an economy across uh, London and the other cities. So there has to be a major redistribution of wealth from London to the other ones, just partly because, as Mike said, we haven't figured out what to do since those cities um, lost their original economic function. So uh, I don't know specifically an answer for the Treasury, except that I would hope it would be a lot less in the future because I think we'd have a lot more finance actually at the, the front end of where city economies are. Now, with all um, respect to Mariana, I simply have never encountered a cab driver who didn't understand <laughs> these issues. They're all, they're, they're all basically small business people, and they, they, they all have a clear, con clear grasp of double-entry bookkeeping. Uh, and, the, and the consistency between stocks and flows, it's, 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 it's perfectly straightforward. It's, on, it's only the professors of economics and the high accountants and treasury departments who are stuck with the single entry bookkeeping that otherwise went out of fashion at the end of the Middle Ages. It's, uh, so I, I, I think it may perhaps a turnover of personnel is really the most important thing that's a, that can be done in this area. Of, Okay, wonderful. So can I just add one thing, because there's a PhD student here, Matteo Deledi, um, and he's, his PhD is actually on this question, asking the Treasury, do you even know how the multiplier, the Keynesian multiplier differs when A, you're just, say, building uh, you know, bridges and roads and digging ditches and filling them up again, versus when you have a mission-oriented policy like the energy bank. What do we know about literally the effect on GDP of every pound spent on having a vision and not having a vision? Right. Could we... Pass the microphone to the lady here, and then if you could pass it back to the gentleman behind you. Andrea Westall, different hats, but for this question, um, trustee of the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development, note that's got a question mark at the end of it. So the question is to the, to the whole panel, what are the implications um, for democracy and innovation there for public purpose? Who would like to have a go at that? Mike, um, uh, I think actually the implications are very good because one of the uh, one of the key problems with our current model is that it uh, validates and often encourages intermediaries to act as government and some of those are quite benign those intermediaries ask your accountant hopefully uh, but many of them are not. So we've, Mariana's mentioned sort of IT providers, very large-scale enterprise, software companies, and so on. And they don't have the same values as public service. And what we witness, not my opinion, but what we, the data we collected shows that there is a continual decline of engagement, of even in willingness to engage in government, when the services are not designed with empathy, when they're not clearly recognized as government. And that long-term trend of disengagement can be seen in uh, such trends as voting records. So a small example would be when we um, got hold of register to vote or a, a huge whopping IT program and stop that and create some more register to vote. You then have, when we did it properly with empathy and targeted at people, we then had three million more people on the electoral roll, there, thereabouts. Now you could say one of the exam outcomes might be Brexit, but you know, not my fault. But, um, but, but the point is, is that there's a very clear line between designing services with empathy and values and then seeing engagement and take up. And the real problem for government is more intermediaries, the more people you have between government and the users, I suspect damages the long-term legitimacy of government and therefore the democracy on which it sits. I wonder if I could just... <laughs> you have one very vocal supporter. Um, I wondered if I could just reframe the question a bit uh, for Mariana. Um, 
I mean, uh, we have a very interesting article up on the FT today, I have to get the plug-in, um, about uh, the Chinese electric vehicle market, uh, which is um, a really interesting example of a kind of market-shaping initiative by the Chinese government. They already produce 45% of the world's electric vehicles, and the government has set a target for manufacturing 7 million battery and hybrid vehicles by 2025. And I just wondered whether, in a strange way, authoritarian governments have a better capability of setting market priorities and market shaping, and whether that is not an issue, or do you think that um, democratic governments are more responsive to what the needs of society should be? Mm. So again, if, if, if you take the answer to the first question that we had, I can't remember who asked it, maybe it was you, um, that let's not think about countries but organizations. There could be many organizations within China, some that work, some that don't, some in the US, some that work, some that don't. What, what my experience is that what works in terms of setting a plan, setting a direction, but, and this is always the big but, enabling that kind of exploration, experimentation, the willingness to experiment and trial and error, what really matters is the organizational structure. So in the US, the way they've actually done this, and this is the kind of hidden story, the point of you know, talk Jefferson at Hamilton, is that by actually having these mission-oriented organizations, top people are attracted to work there. And this, by the way, is also what happens in China for different reasons. It's a very meritocratic government. It has huge problems. This is not a rosy picture. but. Singapore as well. Singapore does it, by the way, by paying a million dollars to the heads of you know, each department. But when Obama had his 800 billion stimulus program, something that in Europe we kind of forgot to do, and so countercyclical spending does matter, whoops, um, he didn't just do countercyclical. He said, at least in the beginning, let's direct this. Let's direct it towards green. And there's a book called The New New Deal that tells that story. But what happened was, that the top green, sort of, you know, green again as a direction, people were like, oh, 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 I'll come, I'll come. So he got Steve Chu, Nobel Prize winning physicist, to want to direct the Department of Energy. There's no Nobel Prize winner winning, uh, uh, running any department in any place of Europe. And he set up ARPA-E, which is the sister organization, I already spoke about it today, to DARPA, but in the Department of Energy. And the guy running ARPA-E was Arun Majumdar, who then, later, after a while, and ARPA is, is doing really, like literally, for you know, energy similarly to what DARPA did for the internet in terms of radical innovation, they came up with a huge innovation in battery storage before anyone like Elon Musk, he then was asked to go work for Google. So he ended up being you know, the vice president for energy for Google. That whole thing, which some people interpret as sort of you know, the backdoor problem, actually, and this is the point about GDS, I mean, Tech City, Tech City had a really, you know, Silicon Roundabout had a very hard time hiring the top computer and, you know, and, 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 um, and software engineers. They all wanted to work in GDS. It was sexy to work in GDS when Mike was running it. It, it, it was very missionary, <laughs> just because Mike is so sexy. Is, <laughs> um, and that's, that's, you know, changing that discourse, changing that story. It's a virtuous it's a virtuous cycle, and the vicious cycle is the more that we talk about these things, it's just facilitating. Who wants to be a facilitator? You're a Nobel Prize winning physicist, of course you don't want to just go set up some sort of facilitating tax credit to be business friendly. Wonderful. Now, just want to squeeze in one last question. The gentleman here has been very patient. Should get a woman. Oh, she was. Thank you. My name is Brian Collins. I'm Professor of Engineering Policy here at UCL, but at the back end of the noughties, I was the chief scientific advisor of the DFT and what was then Burr and then Biz and all of you all know machinery of government change. My question is the nexus between tempo, co-creation and climate change. Climate change is a clock that we can't control the ticking rate of except on scales of two or three decades. Co-creation is to do with the dynamics of the organizations that you're trying to put together to do co-creation, and they all have different, what I would call, heartbeat rates. And if we don't get those things in some level of sympathy, empathy, mm -hmm. planning laws will be a thing that you go, you tear your hair out. You change the digital space in government in five years flat. I lived through a whole period of government for 30 years where sort of all happened. So it is possible to change things and change the tempo very quickly. But unless we do and get co-creation and everyone sitting, accepting the fact they want to change things at a similar rate, we're not going to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone want to respond to that? 
I would respond to it with one word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely correct. Yeah. Right. Uh, now I have one final challenge for the three panelists, uh, <laughs> which is that you're all on the advisory panel. I would like to know what advice you offer. Uh, what is the one major overwhelming piece of advice that you offer to the Institute? Raise. Mike. Uh, run fast and don't look down. Go for it. Dan? Run slowly. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm fascinated by what Brian just said. So I'm still unpicking that one because I think the other thing is scales of linked scales of decision making and really understanding that because there's a there's a danger one can get caught up, particularly the economics around the macro and the national level. And I think also as well as these different heart beats, we have different scales of decision we making we need to see as these nested series of decisions. So from the photovoltaic cell on your roof up to the national grid, from national rail service down to a local bike sharing scheme. Those are absolutely linked, and we don't have a very good way of thinking about that from a government's point of view. Right, Jamie? Well, I would just stress to, that we should remember that public purpose does depend on legitimacy, mm -hmm. and in our society, legitimacy comes from uh, effectively functioning democratic institutions, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, th these cannot be run by the same people who are being regulated. Mm -hmm. There has to be uh, a uh, essentially coming together of the society as a whole as part of the process of defining what public purpose actually is. Right. Well, we must uh, bring it to a close there, but thank mm -hmm. you very much for all your contributions. Thank you particularly to the panelists and to Mariana for a wonderful evening. And I think, uh, as in Mariana's words, this has really been a great coming out party. So we wish you the Institute for the best. <laughs>